This is WEFT Champaign, 90.1 FM, community radio for East Central Illinois, streaming live at www.weft.org. The views and opinions expressed here are those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent those of WEFT, its board of directors, associates, station manager, or Prairie Air Incorporated. The following program is pre-recorded and consists of two parts. The first part is a rebroadcast of a program first aired in 2011. The second part was recorded in 2014. Welcome to Weekend Heartbeat. I'm Sean David, and this is A New Lamp. for old. Remember how Aladdin headed out to get oil for his mother's old dent and tarnished lamp? And in the market he met a magician calling out these words. This strange man was offering to give him a brand new shiny lamp for his old one. That's what I want to offer you if you'll have it. A new lamp of spiritual guidance. But maybe you already have such a lamp which still burns brightly. Great. You are still welcome to join us simply to learn who we are. But maybe your lamp of divine guidance has gotten dented and tarnished like Aladdin's. Or perhaps you have no such lamp at all. To you, I offer a new lamp. Hi, my name is Marilyn. Welcome to A New Lamp, a program designed to make you acquainted with the Baha'i religious faith. I hope you will choose to spend the next few minutes with me. Thanks.
Take a journey today. Let's go to old Persia, the land of lively marketplaces, beautiful horses, men in flowing robes, women in veils hidden behind closed windows. Let me introduce you to Syed Ali Muhammad, the handsome young merchant. The title Syed means he is a descendant of Muhammad. Oh, I've mentioned him to you already, remember? The one I referred to as the Bab or the Gate. As we meet him in 1844, he is 25 years old, having been born on October 20th, 1819, in Shiraz. He was orphaned and raised by his uncle, who sent him to school. The teacher sent him home, saying the boy already knew more than he did. He was of high moral character with a strong sense of justice. He announced on the evening of May 22nd, 1844, that he was a messenger of God, come to proclaim the near arrival of him whom God shall make manifest. Another interesting thing happened that exact same day. In Washington, D.C., Samuel Morse sent his first official telegram to Baltimore with the words from the Old Testament, What hath God wrought? The Bob had many followers, particularly among young students of religion. The first 18 to find him are referred to as the Letters of the Living. Among these was a young woman, Tahira, who was martyred for her stand on women's rights. Thousands of his followers died at the hands of the mobs who were encouraged by the religious leaders. The barbaric ways in which they died are too gruesome to relate. It astonishes me how many horrible ways both men and women can find to slay an innocent person. Beasts are kinder. Some of his followers took refuge in an old shrine and closed it into a fortress. It became known as Fort Tarbasi. They held their own for some time against the king's army, only eventually to be deceived by the commander. On leaving the fort, almost all were slain. I think of it as the Alamo of the East. There were other similar incidences with the same results. I'll tell you the rest of the story next week. Mount your speeds, O eagles of God, the promised day has come. Heed not your weakness or your frailties, fix your gaze on me. Mount your steeds, O heroes of God, the promise they has come. Heed not your weakness or your frailties, fix your gaze on me. The promise day has come, the veils of glory have been cast down, 
The promised one has come now, circle round. I'm just Mount your steeds, O oh, heroes of God, the promise day has come. Keep not your weakness or your frailties, fix your gaze on me, Almighty. Mount your steeds, O oh, heroes of God, the promise day has come. Is there any remover of difficulties save God? Say, praised be God. He is God. All are his servants and all abide by his bidding. Say, God suffices all things above all things and nothing in the heavens or in the earth but God sufficeth. Verily, he is in himself the knower, the sustainer, the omnipotent, the Bob. Thanks so much for being with me this morning. I hope you have found a blessing during these few minutes. If you want to learn more about the Baha'i religion, you can go online to www.bahai.us. To contact me, my email address is anewlamp at yahoo.com. Thanks, and have a great day. Welcome to our guest, Amy Felty. Amy has been an active Baha'i for many years and currently is the recording secretary for our local spiritual assembly of Champaign. So good to have you with us today, Amy. Well, thank you. It's nice to be here. Hi, Amy. Hi, Sean. As always, we'd like to start by hearing a little history about our guest. Background, you know, family, whatever you feel like telling us about. Who is Amy Felty? Well, that's a question that I don't get asked much. (laughs) I'm a retired high school teacher and elementary school administrator. I have three adult children, one in China and two in Champaign-Urbana, and eight grandchildren between the ages of 9 and 17. I like to quilt. I like to read about science. I like other books, too, and I like to be with people. 
I'm mostly interested in my community life in social justice, in um, elimination of prejudices of all kinds, in education and learning what it is that helps people learn more and progress, and in, in doing things in the community that put me in touch with other people who are like-minded. That's great. Uh, so you've been a Baha'i for quite a while, haven't you, Amy? Uh, tell us a little bit about your Baha'i history. Well, I became a Baha'i in 1968, so it's yeah, it's been quite a while. Mm -hmm. um, I was a when I was 15, when I was still in high school. Before that, I remember walking to campus one day with my friend to eat lunch, and I saw a poster on the wall in the Illini Union that was a black and white picture of a of a pregnant woman. There was a outline of that shape, and written on the poster was the was the question, what is the color of the soul? Mm. And that poster really caught me by surprise. And I remember stopping, and my friend kept saying, come on, let's go eat. We don't want to be late back to school. And I looked at that, and I read what it was. And it turned out it was a, a Baha'i meeting. Of course, I couldn't pronounce Baha'i then. <laughs> on, a, on a Friday evening at the, at the home of Garita Busey mm. in Urbana. And we ate lunch and all, and I went home and asked my mother if she would drive me into one of those meetings because I couldn't imagine what kind of people would be talking about a soul. I was pretty sure that religion was all made up by people. There was nothing in it that was good for me, I knew. And I thought that people who were very religious had that as a crutch mm -hmm. because they couldn't get through life without mm -hmm. something. I've heard other people express that feeling. Well, that had been with me for quite a while because when I was in third grade, I was kicked out of Sunday school for asking too many questions. <laughs> I don't know if that's happened to other people, but I wanted to know if the Jesus in the picture was what he really looked like, and I wanted uh -huh. to know where God was. Uh -huh. So the, the Sunday school teacher took me back to my mother one Sunday and said, I'm sorry, but we can't have Amy in the class anymore. She asks too many questions. And that <laughs> oh, was the dear, end dear. of my uh, upbringing in that church. <laughs> 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 so I saw the poster, and I went home, and my mother said, no, she wouldn't take me to a Friday night meeting. Those were for college kids. And it didn't occur to me to ask how she knew that. Uh -huh. And I kept pestering her, and finally she said, all right, I'll take you to a Sunday meeting, though. And again, ah. it didn't occur to me that she knew even anything about that. So we went to a meeting at Garita Busey's home at the corner of Green and Elm and McCullough there in Urbana. And that turned out to be the Baha'i Center in the old days. And I, I listened to the talk that Sunday afternoon, and some of it made sense and some of it didn't. Mm -hmm. um, but I noticed that the Baha'is who were there wouldn't answer my questions. Mm -hmm. When I asked a question, they'd say, oh, well, we have something you can read about that. Or, well, that's a good question. What do you think about that? And I kept thinking, well, I'm not going to get any answers here. And when they broke for tea and cookies at the end, I headed to the dining room because I was a hungry 15-year-old at that time. Sure. And the little old ladies who were there stood up and turned to my mother and said, oh, Portia, how nice to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> what a surprise. It turned out that my mother knew all these Baha'is because her mother had been a Baha'i in Urbana when she was living. And so I, that was the beginning of my two-year investigation of the faith. I had to wait really till I came over to uh, campus when I finished high school and lived on campus mm -hmm. in town. And then I started going to those Friday night meetings. And it took, it took a little while for me to get past the idea that religion wasn't real. But I found such good logic, such reliance on science and investigation of truth in the faith. And as I read more and more about it, I found that the, the things in the faith were full of not a vapid hope, an idealism that couldn't be realized, but, but real goals that the human race could strive for things that I thought could happen. Yeah. So that's what pulled me into the faith. Yeah, that sense of, of reason in the faith it really is attractive, isn't it? It's a, yes. it's, it's a real pull. Like you say, it's, it's not sky, pie in the sky. It's yeah. something we can strive to attain. That's great. That's really, and you've been active ever since. Yes, 
Yes, um, I was 18 when I became a Baha'i and traveled around the United States with Baha'i projects and then lived, um, uh, got married and lived in Massachusetts and Georgia. And then we moved to Bolivia to be Baha'i pioneers in Cochabamba, Bolivia for a time and then moved back to the States. Uh huh. So our kids were born here in the U.S., but partly raised in, when they were children just for a little while in Bolivia. And there is still a family member in Bolivia, I understand. Yes, is there, there are the whole side, my husband's, uh, first husband's side of the family was all f moved from Illinois to Bolivia and is still there. So the cousins are all down there. Isn't that something? And you said uh, one of your children is in China. Yes, my oldest son, Bill Baker, and his wife, Bahia, and their three girls moved to China three and a half years ago for a five-year teaching stint. Uh, they started in a university, and now they're working in a high school there teaching English as a second language. Really? That is so interesting. We'll hope that uh, next time they're home on a little vacation, we can interview them and oh, that have them on nice. our program. <laughs> Very have nice. to get more mics. <laughs> 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 oh, that would be wonderful. Uh, so you've been involved over the years here in Champaign-Urbana with Baha'i student groups at the U of I. Uh, I know we have a few Baha'i students at, that go into school, and also with groups outside of the Baha'i faith, uh, particularly a lot of, I don't know a lot, but I know that you've been involved with interfaith groups we are encouraged as Baha'is to be friends with people of all religions, and uh, obviously you are doing that. Can you give us some idea of what's happening in these groups? Well, it's, it's interesting. I really enjoy being in Champaign-Urbana, and even though we've lived all around the country <clears throat> and out of the country in both Bolivia and Taiwan, I feel most comfortable here in Champaign-Urbana because I know people, know families, and my family's roots are here. Mm -hmm. And it's been very natural to be involved in religious groups because I think even though people say never talk about religion or politics, I think people really do enjoy a good conversation if it's not adversarial about right. life right. purpose yeah. and belief and meaning. And yeah, when I was a student, I was very involved with a Baha'i group at the U of I, the Baha'i Club. And we still have a Baha'i Association there. It's a registered student organization. Um, I think there are about eight Baha'i students, some um, undergrads on campus now. There are a couple graduate students. And then there are several Baha'is in the community who work at the university, too. Mm -hmm. um, Sean, for yeah, instance, right, yeah. who works at the <laughs> U of I. Oh, were you part of the uh, Baha'i group at that time? No, I actually I never was. When I was in high school, though, we used to hang out with them. That was kind of the thing for the... Baha'is that were the, the youth, the junior youth and youth kids who were too young to go to college, we'd often go mm -hmm. hang out with the college group. That was when my sister with was With the there. big kids. With uh, the big kids, yeah. yeah. It was, it was, there weren't very many lines, though. They didn't, you know, they didn't, <clears throat> they, they didn't it's, treat us as guests. We were full members in their minds, but um, mm -hmm. it, we, I, we obviously we weren't affiliated with the university. <laughs> we're just hanging out. Yeah. That's neat. Well, it's fun. And, and of course, the university groups are, are there's so many student groups that it's easy to get involved across groups with different people. And I know as a Baha'i student at the university, we were involved with Amnesty International even back then and um, visitors abroad and hosting foreign students. And um, we love to go to the union building, to the international fairs and things like that. Mm -hmm. And more recently, since I've been an adult in Champaign, I've been involved with the um, Interfaith in Action group out of the Y on campus um, because they also welcome community members to be part of their group. And they have people from Muslim and Hindu and Sikh and Jewish and um, Christians there. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, they're having a big conference in February when they'll have speakers from different religions coming to the campus. And university people are invited, but community people can also attend those interfaith groups. It's very interesting to see how other faiths are looking at the world today, looking at how they can serve people in line with their religious teachings. Um, we also started in the early 1990s a group on campus with the city of Champaign called VRUG. 
V-R-U-G, V-R-U-G, which stood for Vision of Race Unity Group. Oh, We didn't okay. think V-R-U lit, so we put a G on for V-R-U-G. <laughs> and we had several meetings, the City of Champaign through the Human Relations Committee and the City of Barabanas Human Relations Committee, um, the police department, the Rotary Clubs, um, several other groups in town got involved in the racial, racial unity study groups. Mm-hmm. We, we contacted a group from Connecticut and brought in their program on race unity. And that was a wonderful um, time. That V-Rug lasted for a couple of years, I guess mm-hmm. maybe three years, really. We had programs that went into the high schools, and the Rotary Clubs in uh, Champaign and Urbana hosted high school students coming in specifically to talk about race unity. Many people in the community got involved in that. I think there were at least 120 really? um, who were there on a regular basis. Um, We also have been involved in Amnesty International on campus because there are several countries in the world that persecute religious minorities, not just the Baha'is, but the Christians, Druze, uh, Druids, the the Kurdish people, the Zoroastrians, um, different groups in different countries when they find themselves in a minority need some kind of world conscious... Um, recognition to help address issues of unfairness and persecution. Mm -hmm. And here on our campus a year and a half ago, Amnesty International showed a a special movie about the Baha'i persecutions in Iran, which was nice. Um, I'm also involved in Faith in Place, which is a local group that asks anybody of any faith traditions even if people aren't of faith traditions, to consider the environment and how to protect it. Um, They help um, places of worship green up their buildings to use less energy and to be more energy efficient. Uh, The Sola Gratia farm that the Lutheran Church on Philo Road has is a cooperative farm share organization and Faith in Places is involved in part in helping them keep that farm going and right. advertising it. Um, the Mennonite Church has recently put solar panels on its building in Urbana. Um, uh, there are other, many other things in town. They, they've had talks with beekeepers and talks about fresh produce and supporting mm-hmm. the food banks with fresh produce and so on. These are all things that are important to me because when I was growing up, I'd say there were there were four great movements when I was a child, when I was a youth, I guess, in the 60s that caught my attention and shaped my adulthood. There was the Great Society, and Lyndon Johnson wrote the declarations and proclamations that helped move us more forward to eliminate racial prejudices. There was women's liberation that was during that time when I was in high school and college. Those formative years when they really... Uh, take root. Yes, yes, and we were involved in those together, which was an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. And there was the anti-war movement as we moved through those days of fighting in Vietnam. And so many of my friends were in the draft during the 60s and 70s and had numbers that would have sent them either to Vietnam or sent them uh, some some left the country to mm-hmm. be free of that. Several went into the service. Uh, if they were religious people, they went in as um, medics and journalists, not conscientious objectors so much, but as noncombatants. Right. Yeah, some people here may have more to say about that. <laughs> right. Well, just that we, um, you know, when uh, I signed up, I found that out that, you know, Baha'is really can't be conscientious objectors because um, the document that they make you sign uh basically states that you have to declare your disagreement with the policies of the United States government. Mm. In other words, they don't say that you have a disagreement about the idea of killing. It They make it political. So you can't actually become a conscientious objector as a Baha'i because we are, we are obedient to our government. So they, um, they instead, they put you into other, usually uh, chaplain assistants or medics. Um, I'm not sure what the uh, classification for journalists are, but if I know that for medics and for um, chaplain's assistants, it's a different Geneva Convention category which places you as a non-combatant. And so it's so it was pretty um, it, it was a pretty good fit, I felt for a Baha'i in the military. That's interesting. I didn't realize that 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 there was this political thing about being a conscientious objector. Yeah. 
I, so. I didn't either, but uh, when I found that out, I began to look into it, and I found out that that's a problem for a number of, of folks. That and how did you serve? Uh, as a medic, yeah. Who thought that's what you did? Yeah, serve. as a medic. Was that in Iraq? Um, yeah, well, I was actually in for 24 years altogether, and um, I was in the first Gulf War, uh, and uh, then went back to Iraq again for, um, for Operation Enduring Freedom just a few years ago. So I was there from the very beginning and there at the very end. But I really? Wasn't, yeah. You've well, got more history than I realized. <laughs> <laughs> well, during the 60s and 70s, <clears throat> many of the people that I went to high school and college with were caught up in, in one aspect of the war or another. Mm -hmm. And that draft lottery, when, the, when it was assigned and the birthdays, each birthday was given a number, mm -hmm. was a, a tragic day for many people. Oh, I'm sure. I had many friends who... <laughs> who have post-traumatic stress syndrome and who were never the same again after the war. Mm -hmm. Very sad time. Mm -hmm. So there were, there, were the, there were four great things going on. I've named three. There was the great society efforts through Lyndon Johnson to eliminate racial prejudices in the world, in the, in the country. There was the, um, the women's equality movement um, and the famous saying, if you can send one man to the moon, why can't you send them all? <laughs> we all thought that was clever, <laughs> but I don't think that's racial equality. I think that's a little bit of prejudice in there, too. So we have to be <laughs> more yeah, correct gender than equality, that. Gender yeah. equality. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then there was the anti-war movement with Vietnam, which wasn't the first time in a war that people objected to war, but it was the first one, I think, when we had world uh, such fast communication around the world, mm -hmm. and people knew right away what was going on. Yeah. But the fourth great movement that was happening was also a very, very um, big in my life, and that was the generation gap because for the first time, I think, in the late 60s and early 70s, um, young people didn't have the same experiences in their backgrounds and their present that their parents had had. The Depression was not an issue for us. Since I was born in 1950, mm -hmm. I couldn't. I didn't relate to saving, although I was a good saver and a money user, but I didn't relate to using every last ounce of everything with an almost uh, an obsession right. that many of the people through the Depression had had. Um, canned foods had come in, um, fast foods, McDonald's had appeared in the 50s. Um, different kinds of preparation and time savers had occurred. Mm -hmm. Um, my mother, of course, didn't have a washing machine when she was real young. And, and I remember my dad talking about the first time his mother got a ringer for the clothes and how much time it saved just to be able to wash clothes and then put them through a through ringer. Through the ringer, yes. Yeah. And so all these labor-saving devices had come in. Access to telephones was, was uh, much, much freer than it had been before. Um, television appeared. So the generation gap was, became more and more noticeable. And my friends and I of that time felt separated from our parents in some ways that we couldn't quite figure out. And it took some years into adulthood to figure out what to do about that. I'd say that was the fourth great change that took place in my youth. You know, that's interesting because having been born during the Great Depression, and I, I, I'm hearing from you the things my daughter would have experienced. And she and I have, as you say, there's this kind of great divide, uh, many things we, we have in common. And yet, when it comes to many of these issues, we see them very differently. And it does explain. Of course, I grew up uh, going to school with a little inkwell in my desk, you know, that you dipped your pen into. <laughs> we, we heard about those and read about them, but didn't really believe in them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they were real. <laughs> well, we, had a, we had a desk, one of those desks in my house. I don't know exactly where my mom, or, or like it had to be my mom, got it, but uh -huh. uh, it had that little inkwell thing, and that was so mysterious. What was this for? Is this for their little cups of, of milk and juice? What was this for? <laughs> Oh, gosh. So, gosh, this has been really interesting, Amy. Uh, well, well, thank you. It's interesting to look back that far and see what, what it was that shaped the, the world as I knew it. Yes. And, and there was drastic change during those years from your mother to you. 
Yeah. And, and very definitely a lot going on during those years. The, when I found the Baha'i Faith, <clears throat> a lot of those issues that were it, that caused such turmoil in society mm -hmm. were addressed in the Baha'i writings, in to me, in a very logical and sensible way. And so, so I began to understand why it was that there was a battle for women's equality, because that's addressed in, in the Baha'i writings, and why it was that we needed to eliminate prejudice. Was it just me? Was I just odd? Was there something wrong with me? And it turns out, well, I don't think so. I think the, the society that we live in has built up things that we do need to change. Um, and the generation gap was, was quite an issue until I realized that development can be very rapid in a society. And we were caught up in these things that were quickly consuming people's Absolutely. minds and thoughts and energy. And we needed to look very carefully at our track. Yes, I, I, I've thought about it. My dad was born the year that the Wright brothers first flew their first airplane. And, of course, my folks still as children were getting around in carts and buggies, etc. And uh, by the time my dad died, he was all excited about the Hubble and all these space things. And, you know, talk about fast changes. Yes. So it, it is. It's like we went through centuries and centuries where the world just kind of stayed at the same. There weren't major. There were changes, but nothing major. And all of a sudden, wow, we're into space mm -hmm. and totally different way of thinking and seeing things. So anything else that you want to talk about today, Amy? What, what were you doing in Taiwan? Uh, we went to Taiwan in 1992 and 93 for one year to do a year of service. Uh, my husband, Michael, was a computer programmer, still is, but he's retired now. And our daughter had gone to Taiwan on a summer service project, and she uh, contacted us and said, you know, the Baha'i National Assembly in Taipei, Taiwan, needs someone to come and help upgrade their computer system, but they can't pay anything. So, Mom, why don't you get a job over here teaching? That'll be easy. You can do that. And, Michael, you come over and uh, help with the systems. And so we agreed to do that for a year. We had a wonderful time. Wow. The people of Taiwan are marvelous people. And um, we got to, we learned about the National um, Chinese Museum. I've forgotten the name of it. Just National Museum, I guess mm -hmm. it is, in Taipei, filled with about a million artifacts, a million carvings, a million scrolls, Ooh. and special artistic things that were brought by the soldiers of um, Chiang Kai-shek mm -hmm. uh, when he fled from the mainland and Mao Zedong was taking over. And each one of his million soldiers went to the to Beijing and was given or chose a special uh, piece of art of, mm -hmm. of some kind and left the country with it. Otherwise, those would have been destroyed by the army that was coming. And so the Taiwanese government uh, built a uh, safe place, climate-controlled place, into a mountain in, ta ta in Taipei and uh, put those... How can I say it? Took the artifacts and stored most of them and then rotated them into a museum viewing area over a 20-year cycle. Mm -hmm. So if hmm. you go to Taiwan and, um, you, and visit that museum every once a year for 20 years, you can see most of the artifacts that were saved from China. Mm -hmm. We enjoyed that very much. We also found that when we were in Taiwan... We were very uncomfortable for the first two or three weeks talking to people. They spoke English well, and it wasn't a language issue. And we loved Chinese food. It wasn't a food issue. And we finally sat down together one day and talked it through and realized that the Taiwanese people are not sarcastic. So if I greet someone or say hello to someone um, and say, oh, how are you today? They're not going to say, fine, how are you? The, the things that we're used to saying here mm -hmm. don't happen there. <laughs> They'll say, well, I'm not feeling so good, or it's sunny and I prefer a cloudy day, or it's cloudy and I feel better on a Sunday, a sunny day, or, oh, I feel fine, but yesterday I wasn't okay, or something. Took you pretty li literally. Yeah, they <laughs> did, and they respond truthfully. 
Um, if I wore something that they didn't like, my students would say to me, oh, how nice to see you today, Amy. And they'd say Amy because we preferred that for the college students we were mm-hmm. teaching. Um, but that color's not good for you. <laughs> 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 and 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 it took us a little while to realize that we actually preferred that because if we were talking to people, we knew that they were saying what they meant. And if they said nothing, that's okay too. But right. they weren't saying something that they didn't mean. And once we got past that hurdle, um, it was hard then coming back to the United States to fall back into the patterns that we're used to here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, we do have a tendency in this country to, uh, as you say, be a little sarcastic, to say things that are just... It kind of have double meanings, mm-hmm. and, and you have to know, you, you kind of almost have to be looking at a person to know, are they really meaning what they say, or are they saying something totally different than what their words say? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I, I can see that that would have Throwing been a, a, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. a bit of an interesting situation. <laughs> Uh, Shall we take a look for a moment at what's going to be going on at the Baha'i Center in Urbana over this next month? Okay. Here's what's going on this month at the Baha'i Center. Every Tuesday at 7 p.m., there is a weekly prayer meeting led by Joan Mills. Each Sunday morning at 10.30, there is a regular devotional program that includes Baha'i and other religious scriptural prayers and readings, and oftentimes music. On the fourth Sunday of each month, the devotional program will be followed by a potluck lunch at noon and game day, an afternoon of family-friendly fun and games for all ages. In addition, at 7 p.m. on the first Friday of each month, there is an event called the First Friday Fireside. The local Baha'i community invites all who are interested to attend these informal monthly talks, which will cover various aspects of the Baha'i faith, followed by a QA and a session. Additional information about Baha'i activities in the Champaign and Urbana area can be found on the local Baha'i website, cu-bahai.org. Click Goings On to see the local calendar. The Baha'i Center is located at 807 East Green Street, a few blocks to the east of Lincoln Square in Urbana. It is located on the Red Bus Line, and it is wheelchair accessible. So, Amy, could you explain to our listeners... What constitutes a fireside? Oh. Are we going to build a bonfire in the middle of the <laughs> center? <laughs> well, I hope not. We do have fire insurance, but I hope not. Um, a fireside, <clears throat> I, I imagine every Baha'i you asked would have a slightly different answer, but I think the essence would be the same. A fireside is a, a meeting in which there's a, a focused introdu- introduction to some aspect of the Baha'i faith. Um, It might be about a principle in the faith, such as the equality of women and men, or the importance of universal education for all children. Um, Or it might be a paradigm. Uh, A fireside might focus on the idea of the growth of the human race as a whole and compare that to the growth, uh, growth of a human being from childhood through adolescence to adulthood and talk about the human race growing the same way. Or um, a fireside might deal with a specific teaching, um, such as the Baha'i marriage laws and and why they are set up the way they are. Or it might deal with the community calendar and the system, the the, um, rhythm of Baha'i life built on a 19-day cycle that we have. So a fireside is a chance for people to learn about the faith and ask questions about it and often with a with some focus in mind. Uh, okay, that that's wonderful. So, Amy, we're so glad that you've been with us today. This has been delightful. Thank you. Well, it's nice to be here. Thank you both. Yeah, thank you. We're going to be reading some uh, of the Baha'i writings shortly, and hope that you'll join Sean and myself in doing that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you.
contending peoples and kindreds of the earth, set your faces toward unity and let the radiance of its light shine upon you. Gather ye together and for the sake of God resolve to root out whatever is the source of contention among you. Then will the effulgences of the world's great luminary envelop the whole earth and its inhabitants become the citizens of one city and the occupants of one and the same throne. Baha'u'llah. Cleave ye at all times to the cord of trustworthiness, and hold fast the hem of the garment of truthfulness. Thus biddeth you, he who is the truthful, the trusted one. God is my witness. Trustworthiness is a light that shineth refulgently from the heavens, and leadeth to the exaltation of the cause of God, the omnipotent the incomparable, the all-praised. Whoso hath remained faithful to the covenant hath been steadfast in his adherence to trustworthiness, while those who have repudiated it have erred grievously. Baha'u'llah. The fruits that best befit the tree of human life are trustworthiness and godliness, truthfulness and sincerity. But greater than all, after recognition of the unity of God, praised and glorified be he, is regarded for the rights that are due to one's parents. This teaching hath been mentioned in all the books of God and reaffirmed by the most exalted pen. Consider that which the merciful Lord hath revealed in the Quran. Exalted are his words. Worship ye God, join with him no peer or likeness, and show forth kindliness and charity toward your parents. Observe how loving kindness to one's parents hath been likened to recognition of the one true God. Happy they are who are endued with true wisdom and understanding, who see and perceive, who read and understand, and who observe that which God hath revealed in the holy books of old and in this incomparable and wondrous tablet. Baha'u'llah.
The purpose of the one true God, exalted be his glory, in revealing himself unto men, is to lay bare those gems that lie hidden within the mine of their true and inmost selves, that the divers communions of the earth and the manifold systems of religious belief should never be allowed to foster the feelings of animosity among men, is in this day of the essence of the faith of God and his religion. These principles and laws, these firmly established and mighty systems, have proceeded from one source and are the rays of one light. That they differ one from another is to be attributed to the varying requirements of the ages in which they were promulgated. Baha'u'llah. Consort with all religions with amity and concord, that they may inhale from you the sweet fragrance of God. Baha'u'llah. Know thou assuredly that the essence of all the prophets of God is one and the same. Their unity is absolute. God the Creator saith, There is no distinction whatsoever among the bearers of my message. Baha'u'llah. <laughs>
it is not his to boast who loveth his country, but it is his who loveth the world. Baha'u'llah. If you would like to learn more about the Baha'i community in Champaign-Urbana or any of the activities we've mentioned today, you can visit our website at www.cu-baha-i.org. If you would like to learn more about the Baha'i faith, please visit www.baha-i.us. Thank you again for joining us today. I hope you'll join us again next month. Goodbye. Thanks for listening to this week's Weekend Heartbeat on WEFT Champaign 90.1 FM, Community Radio, Champaign, Urbana, Illinois, streaming live at www.weft.org.